Good evening and welcome to today's Telephone Town Hall with Congresswoman Norma Torres and local health officials from both Los Angeles and San Bernardino counties. We are here to discuss the latest on coronavirus. My name is Edgar and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We'll begin in just a moment. We are excited to have you with us today. Before we begin, if we, a few quick points to make right now. We are in the process of dialing out to thousands of homes in our district. So just please stay on the line and we'll be hearing from Congresswoman Torres and her guests shortly. More importantly, we want to hear from you. If you'd like to ask Congresswoman Torres or our healthcare professionals a question, please press star three right now on your phone keypad or at any time during the call. You'll be connected directly with one of our volunteer operators. Again, press star three to ask a question. We ask that you keep your questions brief to around 30 seconds so that we're able to take in as many questions as possible from constituents. Good evening, if you have just joined us, welcome to today's Telephone Town Hall with Congresswoman Torres and local healthcare professionals from both LA County and San Bernardino counties. We'll be discussing the latest on coronavirus and what local and federal partners are doing to keep you and your families safe. We'll begin in just a moment. Right now we're in the process of dialing out to thousands of people in our district, so please stay on the line and we will hear from Congresswoman Torres and her guests shortly. Again, press star three right now or at any time during the call to ask a question. Keep your questions brief to 30 seconds so that we're able to take in as many questions as possible. And now without further delay, we have Congresswoman Norma Torres on the line with her opening remarks. Congresswoman Torres, you can take it away. Thank you, Edgar, and hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on this call today. Uh, tonight's agenda is focused on COVID-19. We will update you on the federal support that is still available, and we'll hear from local health officials that are working hard to keep us safe every single day. Joining us to help answer your questions is Noelle Bazzini, Barcat, a health officer representing Los Angeles County Department of Public Health and Corwin Porter, the DHP Interim Director at the San Bernardino County Department of Health of Public Health. <clears throat> Yesterday, unfortunately, due to a recent spike in COVID-19 cases, Governor Newsom ordered bars closed in seven counties, including both San Bernardino and Los Angeles County. This announcement is a grim reminder that we are not out of the woods yet. Please continue to do the things that we know are helping to keep us safe by practicing social distancing. Wear a mask anytime that you are not able to social distance, six feet apart from someone who does not live in your household. Wash your hands often or use a hand sanitizer and avoid crowded places whenever possible. We will get through this together. But again, for now, we have to keep our distance. Um, before I hand it off to our guest, I will give you a short update on what we are doing in Washington to help our communities through this time. When the economic impact of this virus hit, our first priorities in Congress were to protect workers and families and ensure businesses could get through the, the downturn. We provided more than $2.2 trillion in aid at the end of March. That's the most emergency relief ever passed by Congress and signed by a president. We created economic impact payments to make sure families have cash flow. Even if the economy is on hold, that's up to $1,200 for our workers and additional $500 per child. We expanded unemployment benefits to 39 weeks, and for the first time ever, we made independent contractors, gig workers, and self-employed individuals eligible for unemployment benefits under the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. This was a huge priority for me because so many logistics industry workers in the Inland Empire are independent contractors. To access unemployment benefits, you can go to the California's Unemployment Department website to find out more information on pandemic unemployment assistance or file a claim to receive unemployment benefits. And while on unemployment, those same workers now receive an additional $600 per week until July 31st. An independent contractor has 
independent contractors also have this safety net, not just traditional workers. We also realize that every worker who stays employed is one less person facing the threats of COVID without the safety net of a paycheck. So we, so we passed $350 billion to help small businesses make payroll. The program these funds created are the Paycheck Protection Program, which continues to support businesses across the Inland Empire, and in fact just closed on its last round of applications today. We also included an Emergency Economic Injury Grant Program to deliver quick infusions of, of cash for businesses and organizations. And we added a Small Business Debt Relief Program to help those struggling with their pre-existing SBA loans. We provided funding for small business, uh, business counseling as well. And since then, we passed an additional $360 billion for small business uh, support emergency uh, for medical personnel and increased testing. As important as all of this support is, I wish I could say that we've uh, delivered more. But unfortunately, politics hasn't stopped with COVID-19. And not everyone in Washington agrees that we should continue to provide this financial assistance to our families. We passed a support package out of the House just a few weeks ago. And right now, it's collecting dust on the Senate Majority uh, Leader's desk. It has another $10 billion in small business support. It has another round of economic impact payments up to an additional $1,200 for each worker and child, and it has funding to support medical uh, workers and increase testing capacity. We passed this bill, the HEROES Act, out of the House on May 15th. So far, Senate Republicans refused to consider it, and the President has said that he will not sign it if it was delivered to his desk. Roadblocks like these are anything but helpful in the midst of a crisis, but I'm not going to let this stop me from supporting you. That's why we're here on this webinar right now. Uh, to date, I have announced more than $156 million in COVID support for the Inland Empire, and I'm not about to stop. Those funds are helping our neighbors buy food, pay rent, and they're helping our small businesses make payroll. So I'll close uh, this DC update with, uh, with something that I said earlier. We will get through this together, even if we have to keep our distance in the process. And now I will pass it back to our moderator to introduce our first guest speaker. Thank you, Congresswoman. And as a reminder for our guests listening at home, if you'd like to ask a question for Congresswoman Torres or our guest, press star three right now or at any point during the call. And keep your questions brief to 30 seconds so that we're able to take in as many questions as possible. So now we're, we'll hear from our first guest, uh, Noelle Bazzini Barakat. From, uh, she's a regional health officer for the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead, Noelle. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly clear. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Torres, for hosting this important town hall meeting and giving um, all those in our communities a chance to hear and learn the latest information and have a chance to ask questions. It's really important. There is a lot of important information that is um, changing very frequently, so it's really helpful to have these moments to be able to clarify any misinformation that's out there. We we are um, seeing a rise in cases. We will talk about that more um, as our conversation continues, but we are at a place in history where we're facing critically important issues and engaging in crucial work. We know many are returning to work and um, it feels like a very different economy and a different workplace. Many are hoping that jobs return as businesses reopen and in the meantime are struggling to make ends meet. The reopening is challenging as we are still in the midst of the pandemic and um, finding that it is very um, uh, easy to transmit and it continues to cause serious illness and health deaths. Every social interaction outside the household comes with a risk to both the people who interact and if anyone gets infected to the people they live, work, and play with in the future. 
We're actually aware of a potential impact on people who are most vulnerable because of their age and medical conditions. We do strongly ask that everyone wear cloth-based coverings when they're out and around with other people and practice social distancing, staying at least six feet apart. As the um, uh, restrictions in the health officer orders are getting um, changed to safer at work and in the community, it's really, really important. We can't stress enough the importance of continuing to practice social distancing and cloth-based covering um, use, that's a really important step. And if anyone runs a business or a public space, we um, ask that they carefully follow all of the directives for reopening that make your space as safe as possible for your employees, customers, and residents. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and, and look forward to continuing to talk with you all over the next few minutes and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Thank you for your interesting your remarks. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please, please press star three now at any point during the call. Our second and final guest this evening is Corbin Porter. He is the interim director for the San Bernardino County Department of Public Health. Uh, please go ahead, director, introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Corwin Porter. I'm the interim director for San Bernardino County's Department of Public Health. I second everything Noel said. In San Bernardino County, we are seeing over the last three weeks a doubling of the number of cases that are positive in our county. We are seeing hospitalization rates increase dramatically, ICU capacity being diminished. As a result of that, we've been put on the state's monitoring list, and we are running about a 10% positivity. That's the number of uh, tests run over the total population tested. The state's metric is 8% and our county's running at 10%, uh, well above what the state is asking. We've also, as I mentioned, been out of compliance with our hospitalization rate and our ICU capacity in the past week. So everything that Noel just told you is very, very important to follow. The impacts of this virus are very, very significant and can't be taken very lightly. We're seeing a lot of community transmission within San Bernardino County. That means when you're out and about, if people aren't following the proper precautions, the virus can easily spread. We're seeing cases in the workplace. We're seeing cases at home. We're seeing cases from travel. Pretty much all throughout our community and all of our cities are seeing increased number of cases. And so I would just encourage everyone to do their part. Thank you. Thank you, Director. As a reminder for everyone listening at home, please go ahead and submit your questions now if you have one by pressing star three. We are receiving all your calls right now, so please continue to submit your questions. So we're gonna go ahead and start the Q&A portion of this call. Uh, these are our guests for tonight. Call. So we have been taking questions from constituents all week. So we're going to kick off this Q&A portion with a question pre-submitted by Roxana from Fontana. Question is, what unemployment benefits are available to me? And Congressman Torres, I'll let you take this question. Um, yes, as I um, stated, for the first time ever, um, Californians are eligible for 39 weeks of unemployment insurance instead of 26, uh, and they receive an additional $600 per week until July 31st. Um, and independent contractors like gig workers and self-employed individuals are eligible for unemployment benefits under the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. So um, to sign up for those benefits, you can go to the California Employment Development Department website, edd.ca.gov, to find out more information on pandemic unemployment assistance or file a claim. Um, you can call, also call our office. I know that they've been having um, a bit of, uh, of an issue um, um, processing all of um, the hundreds and I would say thousands of, uh, of, of requests that they have received. My office is there 
to help you if if you need, have any questions or, or if you need assistance getting in touch with somebody there. Thank you, Congresswoman, for the response. As a reminder for guests, press star three to ask a question now or at any point uh, during the call. So our next question comes from uh, Susan from Pomona. She has a question uh, regarding Mask and how helpful they are to preventing the virus. Susan, you are on the call now. Please go ahead and ask your question live. Hi. Um, yeah. Thank you for taking my call. I was just curious. With um, since it's pretty well known that the masks do help from the virus being transmitted from one individual to another, why is it not? Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, yeah. Um, more so that more children are not getting the uh, getting the virus. Can you repeat that last part of your question? You were cutting off, Susan. Oh, um, yeah. I was just wondering if there's any way to be able to help to enforce people wearing masks. Uh, I know it's become a political issue, but um, in order for everybody to stay healthy, if there's a way to enforce what mask wearing, more PSA. Um, I, I don't know what else can be actually done, but does anybody have any ideas of how we can enforce the uh, the, mask, the face coverings? Sounds good. Thank you for your question. Uh, Noel from LA County, I'll let you take the uh, question first and then we'll go over to the director from SB County. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It really um, is such an important one. And um, as I think people grow weary with um, the recommendations and some of the requirements that are coming, I, the, the proper use and the frequent use of masking is one we're seeing um, not being adhered to as regularly. Since May 13th, public health in LA County has been requiring that everyone wear a cloth-based covering when in contact with others and not in their households. A lot of questions are raised about why this is important, especially by individuals who are not worried about becoming infected themselves. The important issue here is that we're not asking you to wear the face covering to protect yourself. We ask you to cover your mouth and nose to protect others, especially since you can be infected with COVID-19 and have no illness, illness symptoms and not know that you're infected. It's really important. This is how you keep your respiratory droplets from reaching someone else. Even if you've tested negative, that negative test only tells you your status the day you were tested. You could become infected the very next day and not know and pass it to other people. So um, if you were already positive with COVID-19, it is still not clear that you have immunity from the virus, which means you could become infected again and therefore pass along the virus to others. So for these reasons and so many others, we really continue to um, uh, let folks know of the importance of wearing cloth face coverings when you're around anyone else. Um, and as, as you mentioned, we are, we are seeing um, a trend that we're not really happy with, which is a lot of people feeling more comfortable going out and about and not using those coverings. We're seeing it especially um, in recent days among the um, younger populations and are trying to do, in LA County we are um, pushing out some social media messaging on this and um, trying to make, get the word out from more of an influencer end and peer end and hoping that will help create a change. And really, really hoping that the message is, this is, this is about the way we can care for our community and care for those people around us by protecting them and, and the possibility that we could have the virus and not know it. It's really important that we all continue to adhere to wearing the cloth, cloth face coverings. Thanks, Noel. Yeah. I'll go ahead and pass it over to Director uh, Corwin to uh, give an update on what SB County is doing and their efforts. Go ahead, Director. Sure. I uh, couldn't agree more. It's been a challenge to get the message out to everyone to a point where they're actually following the requirement. 
We've also seen in our county our largest growing demographic that is COVID positive is our 20 to 34 years old age group. And so we have been working of late with our cities, with our hospitals, with other partners to increase our messaging. The county is in the is it right in the the process now of doing a campaign and uh, really trying to get that message out in different ways. Because as was stated, folks for some reason doesn't don't feel feel like this applies to them. So we're trying to reach them to help them understand the broader aspects of this. As was said, it's not just about protecting yourself, um, but you're protecting others that you may come in contact with, your loved ones, and especially those who are vulnerable, who actually will suffer severe consequences if they get this virus. If they're older or they have medical conditions, this could actually take their lives. And so we are really trying to improve our messaging and reach some of those demographics that we may not have uh, reached prior to uh, this time and so that's one of the efforts we're doing right now to try to get this message more embedded and deeper into our population. And so then this is uh, Congresswoman Norma Torres. I also want to add that um, any help that you can give you know our um, health providers in uh, ensuring that your family, your friends, uh, your coworkers get the message and are encouraged to wear a mask, um, please utilize your social media to promote um, the use of a mask. Uh, that is, uh, you know, um, you are a trustworthy um, resource within, within those groups. So I hope that you will help them and help all of us in that, in, in promoting the use of a face mask. Thank you, Congresswoman and Director Corwin. Thank you very much for your responses. Our next question we're gonna take from the audience comes from Ernie uh, from LA County. He has a question regarding mobile testing. Ernie, you're live on the call. Go ahead and ask your question. Yes, good afternoon and thank you all. Uh, my question is um, seniors and people with disabilities, you know, 24% of all people over the age of 16 in Los Angeles County do not drive. And we're, the, the, the drive up testing system is that the mayor set up again in LA County is really wonderful. But it, it's a lot of people are feeling that, that, that we could get more people tested who are both disabled and over 60 if we had a mobile capacity. And I've seen, I just recently saw that the mayor has implemented that. And I'm wondering if, if, if LA County or San Bernardino County um, has thought in that direction because it's it's just it's where that a mobile unit would come to an apartment complex, et cetera, et cetera, and um, and get everybody tested. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Ernie. Uh, Noel from LA County, I'll let you go ahead and take this question first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, the the Ease and accessibility of testing is a really important issue, and it's one that um, has been a challenge um, just in ramping up testing availability, access to testing, and making sure testing is equitably distributed throughout different regions in the county. Um, so I really appreciate you raising that and the specific concern around um, seniors and those that may be less mobile and, and unable to access. Um, in, in LA County, the testing strategies and approaches are led by our sister department, Department of Health Services. Um, and you're, you also mentioned that the um, mayor of LA City has also implemented several strateg strategies as well. But um, with Department of Health Services, they have been doing a lot of work in thinking about how to distribute and make sure that the testing is more broadly available in local regions and communities. Um, they are working to um, get it um, available in more community clinics and health centers and, um, and distribution across all of the county so folks will not have to do a lot of driving. They've also been working with other organizations like CVS Pharmacy, who continues to have community COVID 
19 testing um, as a walk up with the same day um, or next day appointment availability. As more opportunities get um, established and more testing sites get established, um, 211, and for those in LA County, if you dial 211, that they will know where all those resources are. Um, as well as the website that we've established, the covid19.lacounty.gov slash testing website. I am specific to your question about a mobile unit that's going around. I am not sure about that and how they're um, planning on implementing mobile units in different apartments. I know we are working closely in situations where there are outbreaks to send mobile teams to outbreak sites, but um, in general, for the general public, I'm not sure that's part of the plan, but I will definitely raise that to them and so that they can consider it and explore the possibility. Thank you for that. Thanks, Al. Uh, Director Corn, do you have anything to add for uh, San Bernardino County? I do like the idea. We've uh, taken our testing to different locations, such as churches and senior centers, We've thrown the idea around about uh, a mobile unit, so I appreciate the suggestion. That gives me just a little more reason to bring this up to our testing task force again to see what uh, additional uh, avenues we can take to bring testing to those populations that are not mobile. So I really appreciate the suggestion, and we'll also take that back to our team. Great, thank you both for your responses. Uh, our next question comes from Jeremy, he's from Frontana. He has another question uh, for the Congresswoman. Will there be another stimulus check, and if so, when and how much, uh, Congresswoman? Uh, Jeremy, first, you are in, on the line. Go ahead and ask your question. Jeremy, you're on the line, go ahead. It uh, looks like we dropped the call, Congresswoman. Would you like to take that question? Will there be another stimulus check? And if so, how much and when was the question? Um, absolutely. So Congress um, passed the HEROES um, Act. Um, however, as I stated um, earlier, that um, bill is currently sitting <clears throat> on the desk of uh, uh, the House um, Senate. So the Senate, the U.S. Senate needs to pass it, and then we need to deliver it to uh, the president, and he needs to sign it in order, um, you know, for you to receive a second stimulus. So for right now, the House did pass um, that HEROES Act on May 15th, but we're waiting on the Senate to, to act. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Up next, we have uh, Lynn from Montclair. She has a question about SNAP funding. Uh, Lynn, you are on the line. Go ahead and ask your question to the our guest right here. Hi, um, Representative Torres. Um, I was just very concerned that um, the supplemental uh, food programs are um, inadequate for the needs of the community because we see um, you know, extensive lines at food banks and other resources. So. I was wondering if there was any way to expedite funding for uh, food security. Thank you very much, Lynn. Congressman, would you like to take this question? Um, thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, you know, I, I see um, the lines uh, myself, and um, it, it is unfortunate. Um, part of the problem is that not every single worker, depending on their immigration status, was able to receive um, assistance uh, during this period of time. We are, however, working um, with our uh, local farmers and dairies to ensure that no food um, that they have that they are not able to sell um, goes to waste, and we're trying to coordinate um, currently um, with the local food banks to ensure that they're able to um, pick up um, or receive uh, this food that, that could be available for our families. Uh, we'll continue to work and, and, and push to bring more assistance to our food banks. Um, that, by the way, um, 
this is part of the work that my uh, district office is doing every single week, uh, checking in with our food banks, uh, checking in with both counties, and ensuring that everyone is, is working together and coordinating these efforts. And, you know, I, I have to, you know, really um, say uh, thank you um, to all of the people that are working so hard at the food banks. These, you know, these are mainly volunteers that are helping, you know, our neighbors in this time of need. Thank you for your question, and please know that this is at the very top um, of my agenda. Thank you, Congresswoman. I appreciate your response. Uh, we have another question from the audience. This one comes from Kelly uh, from Ontario. She has a question regarding COVID-19 cases increase. Kelly, you are on the line. Go ahead and ask your question. Thank you for taking my question. As we are seeing the cases increase, are the hospitalizations and death rates increasing at the same rate? What are the current hospitalization and death rates in LA and San Bernardino counties? Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Corwin, Director Corwin, do you want to take this first? Yeah, I can start out with that. So yes, we are seeing increases in cases and hospitalizations. They're not all the same. As I mentioned earlier, our demographic that has the most cases is uh, the, the age group between 20 and 34. They are not as impacted as much. But yes, the, because the increase in cases has also resulted in increase in hospitalizations. Our death rate is yet to go up. We anticipate that increasing um, almost like, if you picture this almost in, as in waves, our cases increase, then our hospitalizations increase, then our deaths increase. We're expecting that kind of trend going forward. Um, the hospitalization, if I recall correctly, they still have about 20% capacity in ICU and 100, um, over 100 surge beds available. They feel that they're in a good position for the remainder of the week, but we're evaluating this daily because it changes daily. So there is a great reason to be concerned to the point that we're actually looking at standing up alternate care sites again. This is an early planning uh, initiative that we had in place. We tabled that because the stay at home order was effective. Now that the stay at home, home order has been loosened, we're seeing those numbers rise again to a level of concern. And so uh, we're now, as I mentioned, preparing plans again to open up alternate care sites should the hospitals exceed surge capacity. Right now, they're just at the verge of expanding their surge beds. And so there is still adequate capacity, but the question is how long? And we're really, we really can't answer that because this changes so dramatically daily. Thank you, Director. Uh, Noel, I'll go ahead and pass over the phone to you now. Um, yes, I completely agree um, with that perspective from San Bernardino. Um, we are seeing a rise in our hospitalizations. Um, just as um, some comparison in our um, very worst days in April um, with hospitalization rates, we peaked at around 19 1,900 um, people hospitalized. We are now um, today, I think we, our report stated that our hospitalization is, is 1783. Um, so we are slowly inching back up to the worst case days that we had. Our lows in um, mid-June went down to 1400 hospitalizations for COVID a day. So we are um, definitely seeing those numbers growing. Um, we also, uh, some other things that we look at in our hospitalizations is numbers that are in ICU, 26% of those hospitalized are in ICU, 18% are in ventilators. We are also very concerned about um, what this will mean and the pressure on the hospitals um, as more and more people are, are becoming positive now. Um, so it, it is a significant concern. Thank you, Noel. So we have around uh, 10 more minutes on this call left. And while we wait for more questions, you guys still have the option to submit questions by pressing star three right now. Uh, we'd like to ask a brief optional survey question to the audience related to the previous question. So the question is, how concerned are you with the recent spike in COVID-19 cases locally and its impact 
on the health and safety of our community. You can go ahead and press one for very concerned, press two for somewhat concerned, and press three for not concerned. Again, the question is how concerned are you with the recent spike in COVID-19 cases locally and its impact on the health and safety of our community? Press one for very concerned, press two for somewhat concerned, and press three for not concerned at all. Again, please press star three now to ask any questions as we wrap up this call. So the next question we have comes from uh, Terry from Ontario. Terry, you are live on the call. Go ahead and ask your question. Thank you very much. Just asking about hazards, hazardous pay for essential workers. Do long haul truck drivers that deliver produce and other products, are they eligible? And is the hazardous pay a hero fund? <laughs> I don't know how to ask it, but what is hazardous pay and is it available, eligible for drivers, long haul truck drivers? Thank you very much, Terry. Do you, uh, one of our LA County uh, or some Daniel County reps want to take that question first? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I, I have the answer to that. That's also an area I'm not too familiar with, so my apologies. Yeah. So we know um, companies uh, themselves are um, providing, you know, some hazard pay um, to these essential workers or workers that have been deemed um, essential workers. Um, personally, I have been uh, working on legislation that would help um, our doctors and nurses um, to ensure that uh, number one, you know, they're provided with um, the proper protective equipment that they need, um, and should they become um, infected with coronavirus, that they are um, taken care of, and should they, um, you know, die as a result of having. Um, been infected with coronavirus, that their their families um, would be taken care of. Also, um, money available to um, to help them pay for hotel rooms um, while they are working. Um, some of them, you know, live with elderly parents um, or have very young children and may not be able to stay in their in their household um, because you know, they come in contact with highly infected people every single day. Um, many of these workers are having to pay for hotel rooms on their own. So um, part of uh, what I'm working on is, is to try to bring, you know, some relief uh, to those people um, with those added expenses. Thank you very much, Congresswoman, for that answer. It uh, looks like we have uh, just time for a couple more questions. The next one comes from Candace from Fontana. You're alive on the call. Go ahead and ask a question. Thank you for taking my call. Um, my, I'm interested in San Bernardino County. At this time, do you still have to have a doctor's prescription to get a test? Thank you very much for that question, Candace. Noel, do you want to take this one first? Um, I think that was specifically for San Bernardino County. Uh, I'm not I'm sure if we've lost him. For LA County, our testing sites do not require a prescription to drive up and get tested in LA County. Yeah, San Bernardino County is the same. We do not require um, much of anything. There are a couple state testing sites in our county that may ask for insurance currently and a little bit more information, but we have multiple sites that do not require really anything other than just your information so you can get notified as far as your, your test results are concerned. Okay, thank you very much both for your responses. Next question, we have uh, Veronica from Fontana. She has a question regarding uh, the rising uh, cases and the concerns with that. Veronica, you are on the line. Go ahead and ask your question. 
Hello. Um, I work in a public school in Fontana, and with the rise in uh, coronavirus positive cases, how is that going to impact the reopening of schools since the push is for students to go to school in person physically? Thank you, Veronica. Uh, Director Corin, I will let you take this one first, and then we'll go over to Noel. Sure. And Congresswoman Torres may be able to speak a little more eloquently about SB 98 than I can. However, the schools are looking at three different models in our county. One, a full return, one, a hybrid model, and one, a distance learning model. I was on a call with one of the school district uh, superintendent's offices yesterday, and they're looking at a full remote uh, distance learning type of approach because of the uh, case rate within their city. So all three alternatives are on the table, and I believe SB 98 clarified that um, funding will still be in place uh, should the schools do distance learning. So um, each school district will make their own decisions. We're consulting with each one of them, giving them our recommendations, helping them uh, uh, when they have questions on, on data and uh, case rates for COVID-19 in their districts and working with them and uh, having multiple calls right now with the uh, schools. So it's uh, definitely something that's a very important topic for us and everyone else in our community. So that's a very active front that we're, we're playing a role in. Thank you, Director Corn. Uh, next, uh, Noel, do you want to take uh, a of that question? Yeah, um, thank you so much. I think that really um, reflects what's happening in LA County too. I do think most school districts in Laco and LA County are looking at um, blended models of teaching and flexibility in um, what in-classroom teaching would look like and what um, and continuing to build on um, the home teaching that's taken place. We are still waiting for the guidance from the state um, that will provide some more clarity around what some of the expectations will be. And in the meantime, we're also meeting with school districts across the county to help them work through their guidance. And once the state guidance comes out, we'll be able to um, issue our uh, local county guidance as well. Thank you, Noel. It looks like we have time for just one more question. We have uh, Marty from Pomona has a question regarding uh, how to obtain services. Marty, you are live on the call. Go ahead and ask your question. Be sure to unmute yourself, Marty, if you haven't already, but you are live on the call. Okay, so his question was, who do I contact to obtain the services that Congresswoman mentioned? Uh, since this is the last question, we'll just go uh, by each guest. Uh, Noel, do you want to take uh, the uh, first response uh, where constituents can get resources for LA County? And then we'll go over to Director Cohen. Yes, thank you. So if you do live in LA County, you can dial 211 on your phone. Um, they do have um, operators in um, various primary languages, and they are open 24-7. And those operators are all trained and equipped to um, support with providing resources um, for how you can access um, uh, support for the various um, services and, and um, funding opportunities that were shared by Congresswoman Torres. You can also go to um, www.lacounty.i'm sorry.publichealth.lacounty.gov, our main website, and there on our COVID site we have information around how to access resources. But the easiest way would be to dial 211, and they will help you. Perfect. Thank you, Noel. Director Corwin. Sure. 211 is an option in our county, too, depending on the type of resources that you're looking for. We also have a coronavirus website, uh, depending on what your topic of interest is. Um, there are some different phone numbers that can be called, but there's a lot of information on our website around coronavirus and what is available uh, for testing, for 
um, various topics, even contact tracing if that's something you're interested in. We have just have a lot of information. But for resources, that's a great place to start. And um, we've got a lot of folks that uh, are in the pipeline to help out. Thanks, Director. And thank you both. Uh, thank you very much. And to wrap things up, I'll turn it over to Congresswoman Torres uh, for some closing remarks. Go ahead, Congresswoman. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me on this in informative call tonight. And a special thanks to Noel and Corwin for their time um, and their in in insights um, today. Um, if you still have a question after this webinar, I want you to know uh, that my um, office, um, my staff and I are here to help you. Uh, visit our website at taurus.house.gov to see the various resource guides available right from the home page. You can also find information about the topics we discussed today, as well as other useful information for staying safe during this outbreak. Uh, there's information about testing sites, uh, mental health support, information about local utilities, uh, assistance you may need, specific guidance for renters, veterans, small businesses, and much, much more. We have information there in a variety of languages also available to help you. While you're there, sign up for our daily e-newsletter on COVID-19. We send that newsletter uh, with the latest information to all of our subscribers every single weekday. And don't forget that while my physical office is not open, my staff and I are working very hard every single day to help support you. Call us at our office at 909-481-6474 or visit my website at taurus.house.gov. Thank you again, and I hope that all of you stay healthy and safe. Thank you very much, Congresswoman, and thank you to everyone for joining this call. Fortunately, we cannot get to every question, but if you have any additional questions, please stay on the line and you'll be able to leave a voicemail at the end of the event. We also encourage you to stay in touch with our office as the Congresswoman stated. You can do so directly through our website at torres.house.gov slash coronavirus to get the latest and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also contact our office at 909-481-6474. Thank you once again to everyone for your time and have a great night.